everyone, and welcome to our final webinar in our series of five webinars on managing weeds in an organic production system. Thank you for taking time out of your day to be with us today. I'm Karen Clausen. I'm from the Manitoba Organic Alliance. And in addition to hosting this webinar series, we've been hosting farm tours this summer, and we also produce some podcasts. So check us out. Um, we have a Grain on the Brain podcast that's available on our website at manitobaorganicalliance.com or on any wherever you get your podcasts. Our partner in bringing this webinar series to you is the Natural Systems Agriculture Group at the University of Manitoba. Today we have almost 130 people registered from all across Canada and the United States, so welcome to Manitoba everyone. Um, we all are living in different climates, but we will have uh, lots of different things that we'll be able to take out of this, um, this series. So today we would like to thank our sponsors who've made this work possible. We have um, FCC, Weed Surfer, and Ants Brothers who are sponsoring this particular episode. And MOA is also pleased to have a grant from the Canadian Agricultural Partnership, which is funded by the federal and Manitoba governments to support our extension activities. If you're an agronomist, you'll receive CCA credits for each webinar. At the end of the webinar, I will put up a unique code that you can scan with your phone. Later today or tomorrow, you'll receive an email with a link to the recorded webinar, which you can view at your leisure as many times as you like. If you have any questions that occur to you during this webinar, um, you can type them into the question box. Please don't raise your hand as we will not be unmuting any participants due to the nature of it's only one hour and so we'd like to keep to time. So just put your question in the question box and we'll try to get to your question at the end. And if we don't get to it, we will send an, uh, an email with some answers to your question. So I'm now gonna pass this over to Ann Kirk, who's a cereal specialist with the Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. Thanks, Karen. So our last speaker in the webinar series is Dr. Pat, Dr. Pat Carr. Dr. Carr is a superintendent and associate professor of cropping systems at Montana State University. Prior to that, he was a research professor at the North Dakota State University Dickinson Research Extension Center. He directed organic and conventional research programs while in North Dakota and does the same in Montana. Dr. Carr was the first and only chair of the Organic Management Systems Division in the American Society of Agronomy and leader of the Organic Management Systems community within the same organization. Dr. Carr was awarded the Organic Achievement Award by that community in 2019 and the Friend of the Farmer Award by the Northern Plains Sustainable Agriculture Society in 2007. He and several colleagues at Montana State University, North Dakota State University, Washington State University, Flathead Valley Community College, and the USDA Agricultural Research Center, along with farmer partners across three states, are collaborating in an effort to develop effective control strategies for both creeping thistle and field bindweed in organic systems. So for this webinar, uh, Pat will be delivering a presentation. Uh, we'll be taking some questions uh, at the end. So please type any questions that you have in the chat box. Uh, if there's something pressing, we may you know, ask, answer a question throughout the webinar, but we'll try to save questions for the end. So thank you and we'll move over to Pat's presentation. Very good. So. There we go. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me today. Um, I've been asked to, how do I get rid of this screen? I guess I need a little bit of feedback real quick. Can everybody see my PowerPoint presentation without seeing me? It looks really good, Pat. Very you good. You can see okay. you and the presentation. So I need to get rid of myself. <laughs> no, it looks great. I like it. It looks good. Okay, I just wanted to, I wanted everyone to be able to see my slides. We can so. see them. Okay. Well, I've been asked to talk today about um, the ecology and organic management of Canada thistle. As Anne said, I'm at the Central Ag Research Center. We're pretty much right in the dead center of the state. So if you are ever in Montana, Montana, I invite you to come by the research center. I would like to show you some of the work that we're doing. So the topics I've been asked to briefly touch on today are the biology and life cycle of Canada thistle, also called creeping thistle, California thistle, perennial thistle, and of course we've all got our own favorite terms for this pest. 
I'd also been asked to, to touch on crops and cropping system choices when confronted with the sweet species, to talk about effective cultural and mechanical practices, to touch on biological control agents and their potential, discuss the time of year when you would till or mow, If confronted with this pass, what to do if wet weather prevents fall tillage, and then briefly talk about our creep stop project and some preliminary results. So Canada thistle is a creeping perennial. So it can reproduce sexually from seed. The seed will form a plant that stays in the rosette stage until it experiences a, fo a photo period of a particular length, which triggers bolting, flowering, and the production of seed. And of course, this cycle repeats. It's perennial, so it can be very long lived, and we all know this. But I think for most of us who have to deal with this pest, it's not so much the, wheat, the seed production that really is a concern, it's the root system. So Canada thistle, like other creeping perennials, can also reproduce asexually via the roots. And it's a very extensive root system. I think we all know this. Roots can extend to depths greater than 10 feet and can grow laterally 15 feet in a single growing season. If we till the roots in order to try to control this pest, segments as short as a quarter of an inch or with a diameter just a little over a tenth of an inch can produce new plants. So if not done correctly, tillage can actually expand Canada thistle problems in our fields. The rhizome pieces can begin to produce a new plant within about two weeks of the root system being broken up, and a fully developed plant can occur within about 60 days. In addition, as I said, Canada thistle can reproduce and does reproduce by seed. The seed does have a fluff that's attached to it, so this would aid in wind dispersal. And we know, at least in the prairie region of Canada and the United States, and I'm sure in, in places where some of you not in, in that region um, occur, know that the wind can take the seed long distances. However, Canada thistle is, is somewhat unique in terms of this dispersal mechanism. The fluff really isn't very firmly attached to the seed. So a lot of the seed produced by Canada thistle actually doesn't fall too far away from the flower. What is unfortunate though, is the seed matures very, very quickly. So after flowering begins, some of that seed can actually germinate within about a week. It doesn't take very long at all. I mentioned earlier that Really what triggers reproductive growth or flowering in Canada thistle is photoperiod length. So once, once we reach a 15 hour day, that is a trigger within the plant to move from vegetative growth to reproductive growth and the formations of buds and flowers. Canada thistle generally is going to have all female flowers or all male flowers on a plant. The flowers are typically going to be pollinated by insects. Honeybees, where they occur, are a very um, effective pollinator. A female flower can produce as many as 90 or even a little bit more seeds per flower. And of course, Canada thistle stems oftentimes will have multiple flowers on them. So a single stem can produce anywhere from, say, about 1,500 to up to about 5,000 seeds per stem. So it can be a fairly prolific seed producer. Once that seed is deposited on the ground uh, under, the, under favorable growing conditions, it will germinate and a seedling will emerge. Now Canada thistle seedlings, and I'm not talking about you know, sprouts that come up through the soil surface from a well-developed root system, but I'm talking about seedlings actually that develop from germinated seed tend to grow very slowly initially. They're very susceptible to competition from other plant species or crops. They're not very tolerant of shade. They won't persist in drought. So the bottom line is, if you wanna pick a stage to control Canada thistle, this is the stage. 
Canna thistle, when it's a seedling and uh, a newly emerged seedling, is very vulnerable to really anything that we can throw at it from a management standpoint. In addition, the roots that are developing on the seedling really don't get to the point where they can start to reproduce asexually for about three weeks. So for all practical purposes, up until about three weeks, the Canada thistle seedling is acting as an annual. It's behaving as an annual and some tillage or again, having a competitive crop in the ground will be a very effective control. So what happens if you've got Canada thistle in your fields and those patches of Canada thistle are fairly well established? There still are things you can do as a manager. So now let's focus not so much on uh, these sprouts that are newly emerged, but let's talk about the plant a little bit later in the growing season. So the day length has reached 15 days, the plant has triggered or moved into reproductive growth and buds have formed and maybe some very, very early flowers. What's going on within that Canada thistle plant is the energy that's been stored in the root system. And that's, that's the energy storage organ in a Canada thistle plant, the roots. That those sugars began, began to move up. They're translocated up from the root into the top of the plant where the buds and flowers are forming. So <clears throat> the, the sugars stored in the root reach their, their lowest or their least amount. I'm not doing this. This is doing it on its own moving. So, so um, I may need to, to move back if the slide jumps forward, which it just did. <clears throat> But this is the time where if you've got a crop in the field, like a hay crop, for example, you wanna, you wanna cut that hay crop, or potentially you could actually mow a crop if you can mow above the height of the crop. This is a point where if you do, do that, or if it's a fallow field and you go in and till the field, you're gonna disrupt the movement of those sugars up to the top of that plant. And that's a problem for Canada thistle, because now it's gotta go back into the root and remove more sugar, more sugar that's stored from the product process of photosynthesis to, to try to move up into the plant. And you know, if some secondary flowers or additional flowers are formed, use them to, to form seeds. So this is really a great time to, to mow or to till. And in Montana, and I'm guessing at least in some places, uh, if you're not in Montana, it's gonna be pretty similar that time period tends to be about late June. Well, if you think about forages in Montana again, when are we cutting our first hay crop or maybe our only hay crop if it's a dry area? It's gonna be about that same time. So getting a little bit of my head of myself, in terms of crops that you want to incorporate into your cropping systems or rotations for Canada thistle control, you probably couldn't pick a, a a group of crop any better than forages because you're going to be probably cutting those forages at least that first cutting right about at the time when Canada thistle is translocating sugars from the root up to the top of the plant and you're going to disrupt that movement. Another time to, to mow or probably more likely till a Canada thistle plant is early in the fall and again we're, we're using what is going on inside of the plant to our advantage. I said in, in late June in Montana, uh, the, trans, the sugars are being translocated up from the root to the top of the plant. Well, just the opposite is occurring in the fall. The photosynthate, the sugars that have been produced from the process of photosynthesis are now moving down into the root system because again, that's the storage organ for the Canada thistle plant, particularly over the winter months. So, you know, if you're a conventional farmer, and I, I doubt too many conventional farmers are listening today, but this is when we recommend that you, conventional farmers apply a synthetic translocated herbicide because it's gonna move down into the root system with those sugars. Well, if you're an organic farmer though, this is a good time to disrupt the movement of those sugars from the top of the plant down into the root system again. So this would be a good time to till or to, to potentially mow, I guess, if, if, if that's something you wanna do. But this is a good time to do that because again, you're gonna disrupt that, that movement of sugars down into the root system. And really the whole idea behind what we can do 
with Canada thistle is starve the plant and try to get it to use up all its sugars. And the way to do that is to time tillage or mowing so that it coincides with um, the Canada thistle plant moving the sugars up and back down. Okay, so that takes care briefly of biology and life cycle of Canada thistle as it relates to management. Let's move on to crop choice and crop selection. And I've already talked about this a little bit. All things being equal, if you can incorporate forages into your cropping system, if you haven't done already, you've got to have a market. I mean, you know, I recognize that, but they are an excellent uh, choice of crop to fight Canada thistle. And of the forage crops, probably the best one is alfalfa in terms of Canada thistle management. Why? Well, alfalfa is a perennial like Canada thistle. It's not a creeping perennial, but it does under you know appropriate growing conditions and if the soil's deep enough it's going to it's going to extend its root down many many feet so it's very competitive with Canada thistle in terms of depth of, of root system in addition because it's a forage we're going to be cutting the alfalfa at least making that first cutting right about the time when Canada thistle is translocating sugars from its root system up to the top of the plant so we're going to be able to disrupt that movement of sugar and also alfalfa is a legume, we all know that. So in low nitrogen soils and low nitrogen fields, alfalfa is gonna be at a competitive and fix its nitrogen biologically, whereas the Canada thistle plant cannot. So alfalfa is a really excellent choice for combating Canada thistle. And if you can get it established, I think you're gonna be pleased with the results in many cases. How about if we're growing an annual crop? Well, among the annual crops, Probably the best group of crops or one of the best to grow are actually small grains. And of the small grain crops, uh, fall seeded small grains are going to be a little bit better than Canada uh, for combating Canada thistle than spring seeded small grains because a fall seeded uh, small grain is going to be well established and actively growing in the spring when the Canada thistle emerges from the uh, from the soil. And of the small grain crop choices that are fall planted. If you, again, you have a market for it, probably the best crop to grow is rye. Rye is very, very competitive, very, very winter hardy, and we know it, it does have allelopathic um, factors. So it's, it's for combating Canada thistle, again, if you have the option, rye would be, and winter rye in particular, would be the, the small grain that I would recommend. Now, obviously, marketing winter wheat is a whole lot easier than marketing rye in many instances, and winter wheat would, again, be a pretty good crop choice. So forages, are, are as a group of crops, is a pretty good choice, very good choice. And of the, the crops that are grown, small grains are, are pretty good for incorporating into a rotation, or if we're in the, the prairie region, many of us are growing them already. But, but have them in your rotation. They're a pretty good uh, crop to grow in rotation with other crops and, and also, of course, incorporating some high value crops as well. Okay, so crops and, and crop choices, we've hit that. Now let's move on to, to cultural and mechanical practices. Burning typically is not recommended as a practice for the suppression of Canada thistle. It actually done, I haven't been involved in this, but there actually has been some research conducted on this. And in some instances, burning does or has been found to suppress Canada thistle. But in, in many more studies, burning actually has, has expanded Canada thistle infestations. So overall, burning is, is generally not recommended as a strategy for combating Canada thistle. Competitive crops are, I've already uh, talked about the, the value of alfalfa in particular, Martin Enns. Martins was very gracious, gracious, gracious. Sorry, in providing uh, me this this table with some data that he and a graduate student collected now several years ago, looking at the impact of alfalfa on the root biomass production by Canada thistle. You can see that in that one column. So what Martin and his graduate student did is they looked at the impact of a pea wheat sequence, so a two-year pea wheat sequence on Canada thistle root biomass production and compare that to a two successive years of alfalfa. And of course, then they had a check where, where no crop was grown. And we know that's not gonna be very good strategy. 
when no crop was grown, you can see that about a ton per hectare of, of just root biomass of Canada thistle occurred in the top 30 centimeters of the soil or the top six inches. Okay, when a pea wheat sequence was, was put in place, you can see relative to no crop, there was some benefit, but look at what happened when alfalfa was grown for two successive years. Just a little bit over a tenth of a, of a hectare. So not a whole lot of a can of thistle root of biomass was, was found in the top 30 centimeters relative to what was found when wheat followed pea. And of course, look at the amount of can of thistle root biomass when no crop was grown. Also look at the column next to it. Look at how much alfalfa root biomass was found in the top 30 centimeters. So again, I think this really does hit home the fact that alfalfa, if you've got a market for it, is, is a great crop to incorporate into rotations. Even with annual crops, you know, put alfalfa in for three, maybe four years, and then move out of alfalfa into some grain or seed crops, and then move back into alfalfa. Now, tillage can be an excellent tool for controlling Canada thistle if, if done properly and if the right implement is selected. And tillage can also be a, a real problem in terms of expanding Canada thistle if the wrong implement is used and if tillage is not used appropriately. A disc is, is probably not the best implement to use if you're if your goal is to control Canada thistle, because what a disc is going to do, as we all know, is going to be to chop up that root system. And of course, that's going to, again, trigger within Canada thistle once the root system is chopped up for some of those sprouts and those salt in those small segments to produce new Canada thistle plants. So you can do a lot for expanding your Canada thistle, thistle problem if you're using a disc and not using it uh, properly. Now, these are some data that Zach Miller, Zach is a weed ecologist located at the Western Agricultural Research Center in Corvallis, and that's in southwestern Montana, if not familiar with the state. And what Zach did, now his focus was on field bindweed, but we would see this, these same results if Canada thistle was the creeping perennial in the study that Zach conducted. And he looked at a lot of different treatments, and I've just pulled out a few here in this table. So we've got four treatments. Treatment one is kind of the check treatment. Now in 2017, the, the study really began in 2018. In 2017, the seedbed was prepared for the treatments that were imposed in 2018. Treatment one, a seedbed was prepared in the spring. So a cultivator was used to, to work the seedbed, prepare it for the planting of spring wheat. That's what the SW indicates. Spring wheat was grown for grain, harvested, and then there was some post-harvest tillage that was done. In 2019, following the spring wheat crop, again, the seedbed was prepared. A pea crop was, was planted. This was a pea cover crop. Okay, the cover crop was terminated. And then after termination, tillage was performed as needed. Now, treatment five, again, the seedbed was prepared. I apologize for these slides skipping. I'm not doing it. Um, and then in 2018, an old alfalfa hay crop was planted into a stale seed bed that was harvested for hay of course and then alfalfa was harvested in 2019 and and this was a a, a pretty a good site in terms of water so zach was able to get three cuttings of the alfalfa crop i wish we could do that where i'm at we're we usually get a single cutting that's pretty much it okay treatment eight now treatment eight we're moving away from cultivation and now we're going into very intensive tillage so in both 2018 and 2019, tillage was performed. Treatment eight, the tillage implement primarily used was a field cultivator or a toolbar with, with shanks and you know, fairly narrow, narrow shovels was used. How often was that cultivator run through the, the plots? Every 14 to 21 days, so every two to three weeks for the entire growing season. And that occurred both in 2018 and 2019. In addition, compost was worked into the, the plots in the fall using a disc. Treatment nine was virtually identical to treatment eight, except even more aggressive tillage was used, and fairly aggressive tillage was used with treatment eight. The difference was rather than a field cultivator, a rototiller was used every 14 to 20 days. 
and the compost was worked into the soil in treatment nine using a moldboard plow, not something that we see very often in the prairie regions. Now, what happened in terms of, and that's field bindweed growth rate. So what they did is they measured the growth rate of the bindweed patches that occurred in the plots where these different treatments were imposed. They looked at the growth rate both in the spring and in the fall in 2019. Okay, so they looked at it in the spring prior to imposing treatments or prior to alfalfa regrowing in 2019, and then after the treatments were terminated in the fall. Positive num numbers indicate that the field bindweed patches grew in size from when the study began. Negative numbers indicated that the field bindweed patches decreased in size from when the study began. And what do you see? Well, we all see the same thing, that as a very aggressive tillage treatment was used, the patches did decrease in size, several fold in fact. So very aggressive tillage over two growing seasons is going to be an effective control of not only field bindweed, but Canada thistle. But I guess the question I, I would ask, and of course all of us watching this would ask, who's going to be willing to do that? Who's going to be willing to impose very intensive, very extensive tillage over two growing seasons? Not too many folks I know of, and I think it would kick you out of organic certification if you try to do that, at least in the States. Now, treatment one, where tillage was used, but mainly to prepare a seabed and then a little bit of post-harvest tillage, but not too much, really wasn't very effective at all. And as you can see, the patches increased over the two-year study. Treatment five, where alfalfa was the hay crop, again, this just hits home the fact alfalfa is a very effective tool to use if you can in a crop rotation. The patches of field bindweed, or if we had Canada th thistle in this, it would be the same thing, decreased in size, maybe not to the extent that they did with that really extensive tillage system, but they did decrease in size and you were getting a hay crop off the plots as well. So tillage can be very effective for controlling Canada thistle. I think you need to select an appropriate tillage tool. Where I'm located at, I like to use a wide sweep. You can see a picture of what I, uh, of a wide sweep here. Uh, those sweeps are five feet in width from uh, wing to wing. So uh, a wide sweep for sure. If you really wanna control Canada thistle, it must be intensive. So about every two to three weeks, and it must be extensive, at least one growing season, the entire growing season from when the Canada thistle emerges to pirate fire, prior to fall freeze up and maybe extending into the second growing season. So it's, it's very, very intensive tillage, but it will control Canada thistle. The shanks need to be cleaned off as you move from one field to the next. And the downside, and again, I think we all are aware of this, this will do wonders on Canada thistle, but it'll also do wonders on soil quality and not in a good way. This will really, really hammer soil quality. Okay, so Zach Miller, again, going back to his study, they did look at the impact of intensive tillage as well as other treatments on soil aggregation. You know, one, one component of soil quality, a soil structure. That's what the two columns on the right indicate. The, under the average column, the, the lower the number, uh, the less aggregation occurred. Under the poorer column, the larger the number, the, the poorer soil structure occurred. The bottom line was, if you really want to ruin soil structure and soil aggregation, till the heck out of the soil, and I think we all are aware of this. So intensive and extensive tillage is going to control Canada thistle. It is. You know, our data, Zach's data demonstrated that. We've actually got a similar treatment in our creep stops study. We're finding the same thing. But I just don't think it's an option in terms of soil health and soil quality. So strategic tillage in combination with other things is I think where you want to go. How about using animals? Targeted grazing, if done properly, can be an effective tool. And there are some data indicating this. Now Jane Mangold provided the next couple of slides for me for this presentation. Jane was interacting with a producer in Montana who did use cattle, as you can see here. 
and strategic grazing to reduce uh, Canada thistle. Now, initially, they weren't using the, the cattle at a sufficient stocking rate, and it did get pretty heavy. What they found was in a paddock that was only 30 by 30 feet, so the dimensions were 30 by 30 feet, when they got up to 11 cow-calf pairs plus a bull, it, they were able to move the cows from avoiding the Canada thistle and really grazing only the grass to grazing both the grass and the Canada thistle. And once the cattle realized that actually the Canada thistle was a, was a palatable forage, then they didn't have to, to be taught that as they moved from paddock to paddock. And more importantly, the calves watched their mothers graze on the Canada thistle and they began to do the same thing. But it, it did require a very intensive high density uh, grazing because initially the, cattle th the Canada thistle was avoided by the cattle. So <clears throat> they were moving the cattle initially on these very small paddocks, obviously, daily, and they found out that certainly wasn't sustainable. So they didn't increase paddock size, but they maintained very high densities. They found on their place that uh, a rest period of 45 to 60 days was, was fine. After about 60 days, they needed to move the cattle back onto those paddocks can of the thistle had to regrown to some extent and they grazed it again. They did find over time that this, this was a fairly effective strategy for suppressing Canada thistle. Their goal was to either graze every plant in the paddock or to trample it and they were successful. And as I said, and what they found was once the cattle figured out that actually they could graze Canada thistle, maybe at a more succulent stage than what you see here, they did so. They didn't avoid it. Now, in our creep stop study, we're not looking at cattle, we're, we're relying on sheep. And I think some of you, and maybe many of you, are aware of the fact that sheep will graze Canada thistle. This is an image you see here of one of the plots in the creep stop study at the Fort Ellis Research Farm in Bozeman. And they have done a pretty effective job in a plot that was very heavily infested with Canada thistle. So st strategic grazing can be effective, but again, it's like any other tool. If you use it correctly, and you really stay on top of it, it can be effective. Just throwing animals onto a can of thistle infestation, you know, at, at, a, at a time that maybe works, but isn't really timed well in terms of growth of where can of thistle at, is probably not gonna be effective. How about other biocontrol options? There actually are several insect pests and pathogen pests of Canada thistle. But at least in Montana, there are only a few that have shown much promise. Now, the stem gall fly is very common in Montana. And in fact, when I go into Canada thistle patches each year, I'm going to see galls like what you see in the image to, to the right here. Very, very common. But we haven't found this to be a very effective suppressor of Canada thistle. You'll find the galls, but there just aren't enough of them, and they come on. You, they develop too late in the Canada thistle's uh, life cycle to really do much to suppress Canada thistle. So at least in Montana, we haven't found the stem gall fly to be a very effective biocontrol option in regards to Canada thistle. Now, I haven't worked with the stem weevil, but others have, and in some instances, they have found this to be an effective biocontrol. The larva feed on the stem and the crown. So there's some direct damage that the insect does to Canada thistle. Per, perhaps just or more importantly, the feeding that it does does result in secondary pathogen infection. And where they've been able to establish this stem weevil successfully, and they haven't always been able to do that, but where they have been able to establish it, there has been some impact noted on Canada thistle patches. They've shrunk in size. But the biocontrol we're really focused on, the one that excites us the most right now in Montana, is a rust fungus. This particular fungus was suggested as a Canada thistle biocontrol back in the 19th century. So it's been recognized as a potential, as a potential biocontrol for a long, long time. But we're re revisiting it. 
Jed Everly. Jed is a microbiologist also located at the Central Ag Research Center where I'm at. And Dan Chachinsky, a graduate student, are really taking another look at this rust fungus. Why does it interest us? Well, it occurs throughout the range of Canada thistles. So where Canada thistle occurs, the rust fungus also occurs. It's an obligate biotrophic rust pathogen, so it's only growing on living plants. To date, we know of no alter alternate host. It's found exclusively on Canada thistle. Because it's a, a fungus, it goes through various uh, portions of the life cycle, including the teleospore phase. And it's this phase that Jed and Dan are really focused on and trying to develop an inoculant that can be used to infect Canada thistle patches. If inoculation is successful, eventually the rust fungus will work on the roots, they'll become diseased, and Canada thistle patches will decrease in size and potentially be eliminated. Now, Jed and Dan really have taken the baton from uh, Dana Berner, uh, a scientist who worked for several years at Colorado State, or I'm sorry, in Colorado. Um, he's now retired, but he still is, is interacting with Jed and with Dan. He conducted a study, he and others conducted a study in Colorado from 2013 to 2018. And in that study, they attempted to inoculate 130 different uh, Canada thistle patch sites. And what they found was when inoculation was successful, there was an 80% reduction in Canada thistle density. So that's pretty darn impressive. 80% reduction in Canada thistle density caused by this rust pathogen. So I think you can see why we are a little bit excited about it. But there were some limitations that were noted. First, it's hard to establish. So that's really what Dan and Jed are working on is trying to figure out the creation of inoculant that will result in consistent establishment of this pathogen. As with many biocontrols, if it is established successfully, it does take time before results are seen. So it's not an immediate response in terms of control of candida thistle. You introduce the inoculant, it becomes established, it begins to move through the patch, and somewhere between three and five years, you'll start to see significant results. Jed and Dan are only in their second year of this study, so to date, they really haven't seen a lot in terms of results. And this is, again, all part of our creep stop project. So there are some biocontrol agents that show potential. We are most excited about the rust pathogen that attacks Canada thistle. And you should expect to get some information out of our project in another couple of years as the, the project um, enters into its fourth year. Time of year to, to till or to mow. I've already talked about this. Tillage can be very effective, but in order to be effective, it's gotta be intensive and extensive, and you're going to have some soil health problems, I think, resulting. You're gonna do everything you can do to create a very erosive surface. Our, our surface, I'm not sure if it's an option. Now, if you do wanna till, I would suggest using a wide sweep if used properly, um, there will be some residue that remains on the soil surface. And initially, when I've used a wide sweep, I mean, there's a lot of residue that remains on, on the surface. So potentially, if it's done properly, you might be able to get away with using a wide sweep and using it fairly intensively. I don't know if I'd go to narrower sweeps, and I certainly obviously wouldn't go to a disc or something like that, um, where among other things, you're going to be eliminating virtually everything to protect the soil surface from erosion. <clears throat> now let's take a look at a, a couple other treatments that came out of Zach Miller's uh, work. That's that one that had to do with field binding, but again, you'd see the same results if, if Canada thistle was substituted. I've already had treatment five up before. I introduced that earlier, and that's where that old alfalfa hay crop was seeded into a stale seed bed, and then alfalfa was cut the following year for hay. I've in introduced another treatment that Zach included. And of course, this is not an organic treatment. So this, this, these plots were not certified organic. 
glyphosate was used and not tillage. But I think we would see the same results if tillage was used and not glyphosate. What's the difference between treatment five and treatment six? Really, it all comes down to in 2018, when the oat alfalfa hay crop was planted, in treatment five, it was planted into a stale seedbed, and in treatment six, a burn down, a spring burn down was, was done prior to planting the oat alfalfa hay crop. And I think you'd see the same thing if the seedbed was prepared using tillage. So that's really the difference between treatment six and treatment five. But look at the difference in field bindweed patch growth. Tremendous difference between treatment six and treatment five. And they were identical with the exception of some control applied in the spring when the oat alfalfa a hay crop was planted. So spring tillage is pretty important when planting a, a spring crop and trying to combat uh, Canada thistle. Okay, Canada thistle growth occurs at about 41 degrees Fahrenheit. That's when the roots start to grow. So you can see it's pretty close to say a spring wheat crop, maybe just slightly warmer temperatures, um, but it, it's, gonna, it's gonna commence growth in the spring. I talked about this already. Another vulnerable growth stage for Canada thistle is, is when the buds have formed. You know, maybe very, very early first flowers have formed, but really when the buds have formed, and that's when you would like to till if you've got a fallow field or mow if you've got a crop in the field. And, and that's also a very good stage to attack in order to disrupt the, uh, the energy reserves of Canada thistle and begin to starve the plant. Okay, I've talked about this. That does tend to coincide with uh, hang of a crop. They did do a, a modeling study in New Zealand and there they, they found that a single, single mowing wasn't as suppressive as two mowings. They did their first mowing in its spring and their second mowing in mid to late summer. But I would argue that, well, that probably is true in regions not like central Montana, where you've got more water and you know, you're gonna get two or three cuttings. We typically get a single cutting in Montana and really nothing's growing very well once we get into July and August. In parts of the US or in, in places in Canada where you're gonna get multiple cuttings, yeah, probably that Canada thistle is gonna come back if you cut it when you first ha have your first hay crop cutting and you may need to, uh, to cut or mow again, but you'd be doing that for the hay crop anyway and it would knock the Canada thistle back. We have found, as, as I've mentioned now, this is more observational data, but in terms of the creep stop study, we really wanted to find Canada thistle infestations and field bindweed infestations. So we were planting and establishing our plots into, into patches of established Canada thistle. And really, um, I don't think too many farmers would, would go out of their way to plant a crop into a, an established Canada thistle plant, patch, but that was really, the, uh, the goal of our study was to find what worked and what did not. So we went in and we did most of those plots as, as kind of an emergency uh, treatment. And it was we found it to be very, very effective. So I think one thing we are gonna do, we're gonna branch out and take a harder look at mowing and see if we can fine tune it a little bit in terms of how to, how to combine that with other aspects of Canada thistle control. What to do if, if wet weather prevents you from Tilling in the fall, well, I think there still are some windows where you can till or you can mow that I talked about already. Don't give up hope. Okay, now to touch on the Creep Stop project before I open it up for questions or comments. If you're not familiar with it, it's a project that involves a lot of researchers. Our focus is on developing management strategies for not just Canada thistle, but also field bindweed two of our major problem weeds, and I imagine many of you uh, could say the same kind of thing. It involves a lot of people at Montana State University, a lot of farmers. We have a lot of farmer partners in Montana as well as other states, and there's several other universities involved as well as the community college. The project has three primary objectives. The first is to determine how these two weed species spread, okay? How does Canada thistle and field bindweed spread in the Northern Great Plains and the Pacific Northwest? That's what those two acronyms indicate. The second is to identify the combination of biological, cultural, and mechanical practices that provide effective suppression. 
And of course, the third, you know, we're educators is to provide educational opportunities. So in terms of assessing diversity and spread, we really want to, we want to know a, across a range of populations of Canada thistle and field bindweed, what is the spread mechanism that is relied on? Is it from the roots or is it from seed? And we all think, I think um, there's probably some combination. Spread occurs as a result of asexual as well as sexual reproduction. But what's the ratio? Does it vary depending on the population that is being evaluated? Now, why do we want to know this? Well, obviously, we think if we know how it's spread, we can, we can really focus on methods that are going to be most effective for control. If it's spread, a population is spread heavily by seed, well, obviously, we really want to focus on fine-tuning mowing because mowing is going to be pretty effective in terms of preventing seed uh, production. But if the primary mode of spread is by the roots, well, mowing is going to have no control. So this will really help us, I think, and, and dictate to us what are the control methods we should focus on. So in order to do this, we're collecting a lot of plant samples. Uh, several organic farms were visited in Montana and in North Dakota in 2019 and well over a thousand individual plants were collected. The plan was to do the same thing in the state of Washington in 2020. COVID kind of stopped us in our tracks during 2020. We hope to, hope to complete the collection of plant samples from Washington this coming growing season. We'll end up with about 2,000 different plants. Um, John Gaskin, a USDA ARS researcher, is kind of heading up this effort. They're DNA fingerprinting every single one of those plants, and we think from that information we'll be able to determine how the uh, plants are spreading and if it, it, it varies as we move from population to population and across different environments. Getting to objective two, where we're trying to come up with the combination of biological, cultural, and mechanical practices that when used together provide effective uh, suppression. We've got several experiments in place, four at research facilities, those are indicated by the large stars. We've got several on-farm experiments. Those are indicated by the small stars. So a lot of experiments are in the ground. At two of the research sites, the Central Ag Research Center or CARC and the Fort Ellis site, we've got eight uh, four-year crop sequences in the ground. Now, as you can see in 2022, we have a common crop that's hard red spring wheat across all those eight sequences. The sequences vary from some that are very forage heavy, like uh, crop sequence one, to sequence number eight, where forages are excluded and are very tillage heavy. And that should look familiar, where we've got basically two successive years of fallow, where we're, we're tilling every 21 or so days. Now, not included in this slide is also superimposed across these treatments are different tillage regi regimes. So we've, we've got all these eight sequences and what we're calling a conventional tillage regime, regime where we're, we are using tillage appropriately. You know, we're, we're tending to um, establish the seedbed in the spring with a little bit of tillage and then plant, et cetera, but not excessive tillage except for treatment eight. And then we've got a reduced tillage regime. We're avoiding tillage in some years. We're using animals to graze some of the plots uh, rather than uh, disturb the soil and that kind of thing. Okay, so let's take a look at some very preliminary data. Let's compare the amount of biomass that a Canada thistle produced in plots where a barley alfalfa crop was planted, a lentil crop, a lentil plus uh, sweet clover, and a nine species cover crop mix. So at our Fort Ellis and Central Ag Research Center sites, along the y-axis, you can see Canada thistle biomass. And along the x-axis, you can see the crop biomass across the four treatments. Lentil, the barley alfalfa mix, the um, <clears throat> spring wheat, and the, the nine species cover crop mix. And not too surprisingly, as Crops were more and more competitive as we were able to establish them in some plots very successfully where Canada thistle patches were lower, um, the Canada thistle biomass production was suppressed. In plots where uh, the 
the crops were not as effective, Canada thistle biomass was, was greater. What is maybe a little bit interesting is at a particular biomass level, so across the same biomass level and those four treatments, it didn't depend on what crop was in those plots. Generally, and not too surprisingly, Canada thistle biomass was greatest in lentil plots, even if the amount of, of biomass produced by that lentil was the same as it was in the barley plus alfalfa plots. So in terms of ranking of the, the biomass types, Canada thistle biomass was greatest in plots where lentil biomass was produced, followed by a barley alfalfa mix, which was about the same as the spring wheat. And then Canada thistle biomass was least in cover crop plots at Fort Ellis and very, very similar rank at the Central Ag Research Center where again, Canada thistle biomass was greatest in, in plots where lentil biomass was produced, then spring wheat, and at the Central Ag Research Center where the barley alfalfa a crop was planted and, and growing, it suppressed Canada thistle in terms of biomass production right about the same as the nine species cover crop mix. So preliminary observations from the work that we've done and are doing, we can, we know we can control, I would use a stronger word, we can't control Canada thistle if intensive and extensive tillage is used. But I think the environmental costs are really uh, prohibitive in terms of, of that type of treatment occurring. I think it's more using strategic tillage along with some other mechanical, biological, and cultural controls. Now, infrequent tillage, particularly when using an inappropriate implement but it will do a lot to transplant and expand Canada thistle problems. So infrequent tillage is not the answer. In fact, it's going to exacerbate the problem. Alfalfa is a, an alfalfa and hay crop in particular is about the best option that you could have if you've got a Canada thistle problem in a field. The goal is to establish the alfalfa successfully. And if you can do that, I think you're gonna be very happy with the results. Now, one thing the creep stop study is really in home to me, and we all know this, but it, I've been able to see it, is environment oftentimes will trump a treatment. And what works in one location may not necessarily work at a different location. So some of, of what we find out of our creep stop project, I'm confident, is going to have application in Montana and in other similar environments in the Great Plains or even outside of the Great Plains. But there's a big caveat. Some of the things that we find which may work very well in Montana may not work in your environment if you are in a more humid and warmer environment than ours and vice versa. Okay. We do, do need to better understand some of the nuances. Moin will work. I've identified a, a time period in the Canada thistle, a life cycle where it seems to be effective, but I think we need to better understand under what other conditions is mowing most effective. Okay, so I think there's some things that we can still fine tune and we need to. So please stay tuned. As I said, we're only into our second year of our creep stop project. Uh, we've got several years to go and I think there's gonna be a lot left to learn. So that's what I've got today and I'll open it up to questions or comments or observations. You know, I'm here to learn as much as I am to share, so. Fire away. Thanks, Pat. That was an excellent presentation and a lot of really good information. I have quite a few questions here, so I will start off. Um, there's a question here, if a rod weeder is comparable to a wide sweep cultivator with for kind of thistle control. Sure. Um, I haven't used a right, wide weeder to do that. Oh, a rod weeder, let's try that again. A rod weeder to do that? Um, yeah, I mean, potentially, I mean, the, the idea is the same, you know, with the wide sweep, we're running it as a, at a shallow depth as you would a, a rod weeder. The blades are nice and sharp, so it, it does do a pretty good job of cutting the can of thistle, whereas with the rod weeder, especially the first time through, I'm not, I'm not sure how successful that would be at, at severing, you know, a well-developed Canada thistle. Um, stand, but potentially, particularly if the root system isn't very well developed, the idea is you really want to cut those roots, you want to sever them. 
Um, and, you know, a rod weeder is, is great for, you know, weed seedlings, um, but I haven't tried it, so, so perhaps it would. Thanks. So another question here is, uh, will alfalfa seed production provide some of the same control benefits of alfalfa forage production? It will. Yeah, it will. You know, you're not you're not haying the crop, so you're not you're not cutting it, which again is going to disrupt the movement of the sugars from the Canada thistle root up to the top of the plant. But alfalfa is pretty competitive, and and so that's where you know if it's established it's going to provide some pretty good competition to that Canada thistle plant. You know, and particularly, as I said, it's going to be at a competitive advantage in fields where nitrogen is naturally low. You know, if you move into a field and you probably wouldn't be applying any uh, nitrogen fertilizer to your alfalfa plant, it's going to be a competitive advantage. So, it, so an alfalfa seed crop is going to provide some control. It would be better, you know, if it was hay, because again, you're kind of, you're, you're combining basically a mechanical tool with a, a uh, biological tool to control that can of thistle. But, but it's certainly better than, than many of the other uh, crop options if you're looking at some annual crops. Great. Uh, and would you recommend a routine tillaging of a buffer edge around a field uh, to stop can of thistle from creeping in? Um, yeah, I it, it mean, again, you, you can do that and it, it can be effective in kind of creating that, that buffer. We do, in a way, we do that in some of the studies where we're, we're tilling around the plots to try to minimize that. Um, you know, I grew up, I mean, I basically was schooled in the 70s and 80s, so I'm, a, I'm more of a, a, a reduced tillage type person. So, but, but it can be done and it will provide um, some protection from movement of Canada thistle into the, into the field. A better, a better strategy would be to try to suppress the Canada thistle patches that are in the next field over, so. Uh, and for annual crops, is seeding at a heavier rate a good strategy for Canada thistle competition or to compete against Canada thistle? <clears throat> um, yeah, I mean, you just as I think with many organic farmers, you know, I, I, I should be asking you all, uh, how many are, are watching? You know, what do you do? But I think a common practice among organic farmers is to, in many cases, increase their seeding rate relative to their conventional counterparts. It, it can be, you know, effective, but you have to weigh that uh, with, you know, what the environment can handle. I mean, you really want to, you want to establish a, a good plant canopy and necessarily increasing the density um, isn't always going to provide the most effective canopy, particularly if you're in a dry environment like central Montana, if we plant, say, our, our wheat crop too heavy, um, we'll be very successful in setting that wheat crop up to when it gets dry, not producing a whole lot of grain. So I think it's it can be effective. I would say that maybe a, a better answer would be just make sure you're planting your crop at, a, at an appropriate density where you're getting a good crop stand and, and maximizing the canopy that that crop is going to produce. Thanks. That I'm makes sure a lot that of sense. answered it, but <laughs> no, I think that's a very helpful answer. Uh, so there's a Karen. Do we have time for one more question? Very very quickly, <laughs> one minute. Okay. Sure. Um, I guess I'll just add, the question is: Is there other recommendations for getting canna thistle established in fields with heavy canna thistle patches? I didn't understand. Are there recommendations for establishing Canada thistle? No. All right, for establishing alfalfa, if you have a, some Canada oh. thistle patches in your field, what would you recommend for getting alfalfa established? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's a better question. Um, okay, very quickly, how long do I have, Karen? One minute. Okay. <laughs> well, you know, I, I guess in regards to that, one slide I showed early, earlier where it had that glyphosate, you know, I would obviously, if you're planting into a field, I would I would certainly till the field in the spring and I'd plant the alfalfa as early as you possibly could to give it as much of a head start as possible. Now, to be honest with you, um, I think you want to avoid patches if you possibly can, but I will say as a caveat, you know, we planted Canada thistle in, or, or alfalfa into those plots as I, I talked about, and there were heavy Canada thistle stands. 
And I was shocked to see that in some of those plots were, I mean, there was no way that alfalfa was going to survive in those plots that it actually survived. So I'm not saying that it's always going to be successful, but in some environments, it was amazing that the alfalfa actually established. And once it did, it started to really come on. And, you know, the story has yet to be told, but ask us in a couple more years. Excellent, thank you for everyone. Thank you for your presentation and thank you to everyone who um, submitted questions. Yeah, we will be able to um, send you some answers to those questions, because I know there's lots more that haven't got answered yet. So we can send those in an email to you when we um, send more information. But thank you very much, Pat and Anne. That was a fantastic, presentation. I feel like my I've got lots lots that I learned. Um, so I just wanted to thank our sponsors again. We have Weed Surfer, um, which provides some mechanical weed control options. FCC sponsored all of our webinars and we Entz Brothers, who's a John Deere equipment dealer who sponsored this um, webinar. I just wanted to give a shout out to our team. A lot of people worked hard to put these webinar series together, especially Laura Telford, um, Martin Enns from the University of Manitoba, Ann Kirk, Will Bailey Elkins, Jess Nixie, Catherine Stanley, and Myra Van D. So thank you to everyone who helped put this series together. So thanks so much for attending our webinar series. If you missed any of our five webinars, we had five all together, you can actually still sign up to receive the access to the recordings. So you just go to our website and it'll go to the events, it'll send you to the link to register and you just have to sign up and we will then just send you the recordings. And if you have any feedback for us, we'd love to hear from you what you liked, what you didn't like uh, about the webinar series. And also if you have any ideas for topics, because we will be producing more activities in the next year so just let us know what kind of topics you'd like us to to talk about and you can send us uh, an email at info at manitobaorganicalliance.com or just go to our website and you'll find out how to contact us there so do keep in touch with us by going to our website and following us on twitter so thank you very much and have a great rest of the holiday season everyone see you next time